Okay, we have to understand this is a complicated verse. One of the professors I had in Bible College Seminary was Dr. Peter Cottrell, a tremendously talented and tremendously gifted lecturer, both academically but also practically. He'd been a missionary for a number of years in Africa. And he knew about the persecution of Christians, and he knew about hunger, even starvation, famine in Africa that Christians went through. And I recall him citing this verse as problematic. In his view, it was a testimony of the psalmist, of the psalmist's own experience, that the psalmist may not have been making a universal statement. Now, that is a point of view. I don't fully agree with it, but it is a point of view that has some validity. The psalmist is speaking for himself, but I do see it as a statement having doctrinal merit. Let's understand this. I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken. Forsaken by man, yes. Forsaken by God, no. Christians have always been persecuted, have always suffered. I point people to the book by someone who I actually knew, a, a, a Jewish believer, Richard Wormbrand, tortured for Christ. Was he forsaken by man? Yes. Was he forsaken by Christ? No. He had an incredible testimony. Then he goes on, I've not seen this happen, and I've not seen the righteous or his descendants begging bread. We can understand this as the bread of life. We can understand it as talking about Jesus as the bread of life. We can understand it as talking about the word of God. Um, I do know this, that in the Middle Ages, when the Waldensians were being persecuted by the Roman Church, they were dying of hunger and exposure. They had children who were sealed up in, in the Alps, and the Catholic Church was trying to wipe them all out because they were Christians. Uh, how do you explain this? Well, again, you can take the angle that bread is the bread of life, but we need to be careful not just to spiritualize something away because it doesn't fit our theology. So we can establish those two points. It was the psalmist's own experience, and secondly, it's speaking of the bread of life. But the third is this. Look at it carefully. I have never seen them begging bread. Begging bread. They didn't beg for bread. The ravens fed Elijah. Either the Lord fed them or the Lord took them. So the psalm does not fail. The psalm does not fail. Neither in the testimony of the Waldensians or any other Christians that I'm aware of. They did not go out and beg bread from the unsaved. They begged God, but they did not beg man. Or they beseeched God, they beseeched the Lord, but they did not beg man. So taken absolutely literally without spiritualizing it, although there is a spiritual meaning in it to do with the bread of life and the word of God, the prophecy is, is valid. Where have Christians ever begged the world or begged the unsaved or begged non-believers for bread? Uh, where have, have saved Christians done that? My grace is sufficient. If the Lord lets a believer suffer that kind of hardship, the Lord will give them the grace to cope with it. Uh, again, the idea of Christians in an age of hunger. There was a terrible book written by a Christian socialist who tried to unite Christianity with socialism, Ron Sider. That man is so screwed up both in his economics and his theology, it's pathetic. <clears throat> Nonetheless, many Christians have subscribed to this wrong kind of thinking. Uh, exegetically, exegetically, the psalmist never saw it never saw God's people begging for bread or their descendants. And I haven't either. I haven't either. Uh, there was one time that I was with my wife in Paris. And uh, we'd been there because my daughter was going to do part of a law degree in Paris on an exchange program at the Col de Deux in Paris, at the, the National Law School. And because of the high Islamic population and so forth, I was very selective as to where she would live, and 
I was over there basically apart, apartment hunting for my daughter. I wanted to pick out where she was going to live and how far it was going to take her to get to school by, by, the, by the metro and so forth. As I was there with my wife and we were walking near La Comédie in the center of Paris. And I saw a woman kneeling down with a sign, I'm hungry. And I was, you know, I, I don't give money to street people. I only buy them food. I'd rather donate money to a shelter, to a Christian shelter or something, or a Christian rescue mission. But I wouldn't give money to a street person because it might go to alcohol or drugs or tobacco or something like that. But I would buy them something to eat. So I spoke to the young woman in French and she didn't speak French. I looked at her complexion. I tried Spanish. She didn't speak Spanish. I asked her if she spoke German, English, whatever. None of that. And then I, I just said, um, you speak Romanian. And she, her face lit up and she said, yes. And my wife, of course, is born in Romania. And my wife begins speaking to her in fluent Romanian. Mine is terrible. And uh, <clears throat> we find out that she's a Christian and she has a family. But they're, they were kind of like refugees. This is after the Iron Curtain came down, not too long after. So we took her to a nice restaurant and got her something to eat and things like that. And I got help for her with the... Paris branch of the Salvation Army, which were evangelical. They were believers at that time. I don't know now. And we got help for her family. <clears throat> and we got her something to eat. And we helped them financially, whatever we did. Um, the Lord put us there because he did not want his people begging for bread from the unsaved. I told her this was not to happen. This is not God's will. Uh, thinking of this verse, that was the situation. I said, look, God doesn't want to see his people begging for bread. You go to the Lord, and the Lord brought us here. I see your sign in French telling me you're hungry. That somebody obviously helped you write in French. You couldn't speak French. You couldn't speak Spanish or any language that I know. And uh, <clears throat> finally, we get Romanian, which my wife speaks fluently. I speak it, but not, not as well as my wife. And... We, we were able to get her food and help her family and all this stuff. Why? Because I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. The Lord put an end to it in that situation. Now, that's a testimony of my own experience. I found the verse to be true, studying church history and in my own experience. But I do not contest the experience of others, such as Dr. Peter Cottrell. Others may have a different perspective. But exegetically, I've answered the question as accurately as I can. Thank you so much for asking it. It is a good one and a challenging one. God bless and thank you. My name is Jacob Prash from Moriel. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. 
the dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast, shadows of the beast, how the coming antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, shadows of the beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you. Thank <laughs> you.